But to help us to help us narrow down a little bit, if in the chat you could just introduce yourself briefly, um, say your name, say what neighborhood you live in, and then if you can write your council district, uh, that would be really helpful if you know your council district. If you don't know your council district number, but you know who you're represented by, you could put that in. And if you don't know either of those things, that's also okay, but it would be useful to know and I can make sure to show you how to, uh, how to find out who your council member is uh, and we can include that as well. So if you, if you have a moment to drop that in, in the chat, um, go for it. And then with that, Betsy, uh, I'll turn it over to you to start. Speaking of technological um, problems, do I have to push anything so you can hear me or not? We can hear you. We can hear you just fine. Okay, should, there, should I start now or should I wait till everybody becomes non-Dan Kaminsky? <laughs> you can go ahead, I think. I think you can go ahead, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for, for joining in on our training tonight and thank Dan for doing it. Um, I, I think the one thing that is so important that people know in the city and many people don't know it, how really vital the city council is to you and me and everybody who lives here because it's through the city council that we can get you know things done through government. I mean it's one of it's one of the easiest ways. Every council person has a constituent services um, division or part where they have a they have one or two offices in in the district and people can go there with their problems and their ideas and everything. And it's just such a vital part of connecting people to what goes on in New York City. So our effort here to make the, um, the lines, the, re the district lines for, for the council is just really, really important. And I'm very glad you're doing this. And I plan to learn a lot because I need to learn a lot. I don't I don't know how these district lines are looked at or how they should be looked at. So I'm looking forward to what Dan has to say. That's it, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Betsy. Thank you for the folks in the chat uh, giving some council districts that'll, that'll help us out here. Um, so the first thing to say <clears throat> uh, before I begin is that I am fully aware that uh, in the headlines, dominating the headlines is the state redistricting fiasco, uh, if we can call it that. Uh, today, so it'll, it's entirely understandable if the fact that the council redistricting process is happening right now has in many ways slipped the attention. So that's what we're doing today is kind of recentering, talking about this process that is happening right now. Um, I'm sure folks have questions too about the state process and I'm happy to address those, uh, but we'll save that for the end. Uh, and really kind of the heart of today, we're talking about the council and what's happening What's happening there? So, uh, first and foremost, can can everybody see my screen? No. Now I now all I have is the title. What do I do? Help. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I can see it. Betsy, what what do you see? I see the council redistricting training. Yeah. The, oh, that's, yeah. That's what we want you to be Perfect. seeing. Oh, I can't. Yeah, but, and I can see you in a very small picture, Dan, but nobody else. Okay. Both of those things are right where we want them to be. So Good. we're all, we're all in the right place. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, to, to get us kind of kicked off here, um, I can, in many ways, this is the first slide. In many ways, I can skip this because you all know who Citizens Union is and what we do, uh, which uh, allows, allows for a bit of a, a fast forward. The only thing to say from this, this starting here is that <clears throat> uh, we, in addition to all of the work that we do, you know, we've been monitoring the city council redistricting and state redistricting processes for decades. Um, and this time around with, with help from the New York Community Trust, we're not only monitoring it from the watchdog side, but we're also doing the civic engagement piece, which is what we're doing here today. So uh, we, I will add in for this particular group, uh, the, some of the advocacy work that we're doing, just so folks, because you're all citizens, union members, or many of you are, can kind of be aware as, as what's going on on the watchdog side of our work uh, with redistricting. Um, but the the second side is trying to get people involved. And so kind of full transparency that that the, my goal in doing these trainings uh, and it is to, at the end of the day, have at least some of the people on the trainings testify. Um, we've been going around 
to, we've already hit all five boroughs. Uh, we've done probably 30 trainings, give or take, with groups, all sorts of groups from all different parts of the city. Um, and, and really what, what we are doing is hoping to educate and then activate. So, you know, trying to get people informed about the process so that they can ultimately testify in front of the commission. Um, so in terms of today, uh, the th three major goals of what to talk about, at, at a very basic level, I'm hoping to talk about what redistricting is, which I'm guessing this group happens to be, you know, pretty well aware of, why it matters and why it matters to you, kind of going into what Betsy started by talking us about, and then how to get involved. So that's kind of my major checklist of what to cover on, on this training. Um, a little deeper than that, so we'll, we'll go through some of the criteria, or rather the criteria that the, the commission who draws the maps use uh, in drawing the maps. We'll go over how this process is gonna unfold. Uh, we'll go, again, we'll go over why it's important. Uh, we'll, we'll go over testifying uh, logistics and analyzing maps. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about building your own maps. Often when I say that, the kind of the walls go up for people and I wanna knock those walls down uh, and make it as user-friendly as I possibly can. Um, and then how to give an effective testimony. So for folks who, uh, who are going to testify, helping break it down to make it as, you know, as easy as possible. So that's what we have going on. Um, it's a lot of information. So on Zoom, what I found is that instead of having sort of interruptions happen, I'll sort of just talk for 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then at the end, we'll, we'll leave time for as, you know, as really as many questions as folks have. And as I said, if folks also want to hear about the state process and what's happening there, I'm happy to share uh, what's happening. So that's what, uh, that's what we have for today. And again, just to be very, very clear, we're only talking about, with this train, we're only talking about the council. So starting at uh, kind of square one, what is redistricting? Uh, so at that sort of most basic level, redistricting is the process of drawing new district lines. And it happens every 10 years after the census. And so after the census comes out to account for the demographic changes, for the population changes, et cetera, that have happened throughout New York City, uh, new lines are drawn. <clears throat> so you see the current district map uh, at the right. And as I said, right now, uh, really pretty much starting very soon, all of these lines or many of these lines will be changed. So the first thing to talk about is, well, uh, how are these lines changed? What are the criteria that these lines are changed using? So there's eight essential criteria that map makers use to figure out new districts. Of those eight, four are required and four are, I, I believe the language used is to the most practical uh, extent possible. So. Uh, they try to, but it's not uh, not quite in the same category. So I split them up, and I want to talk about one by one what these criteria are, and then again try and apply them to some of the districts that you all mentioned. Uh, so this first person, this first one, is one person, one vote. This is a constitutional mandate. Protecting minority votes is a federal Voting Rights Act mandate, and then these last two are charter mandates. So again, uh, to go through one by one. <clears throat> so one person, one vote. So the idea here is that each district should have roughly equal representation. Uh, you know, if, for example, one district had one person and one district had one million people, obviously the levels of representation afforded to that one person versus that million people would be radically different. So districts should be split up into about the same size so that each person throughout the city has equal level of representation. So kind of the basic formula for how to get to that roughly equal population is your ideal population in any district is the total population of that city or that place divided by how many districts there are. So just as an example, let's say New York City had 100 people in it. If we only had five districts, to have the ideal population, there would be 20 people uh, per district. But to kind of ground down to New York City numbers, right? So New York City's population after the 2020 census is 8.8 .8 million people. That is the largest our city has ever been uh, by a pretty significant amount. Uh, we grew something like 600,000 people from the last census. So you take that number, 8.8 .8 million people, and you divide it by 51 council districts. And if you do that, uh, at least what our analysis is showing is that you, the ideal population is about 172,000 people. Um, 
this, you know, uh, subject to changed some, some amount, but that's, you know, from, from what our understanding. Um, now, a 5% deviation is allowed. So what that means is that, you know, the expectation isn't that every single district will have exactly 172,881 people in it. Instead, 2.5% below that number is allowed and 2.5% above that number is allowed. And that is something that is uh, relatively new. Governor Kathy Hochul signed that, I believe, in October. Uh, prior, it was 10%. And so just that change from 10% deviation to 5% lets us know that a substantial number of districts are going have to have to change. Uh, so in real terms, that means that over the next decade, and keep that in mind, that the lines that are drawn are locked in for uh, the next 10 years, uh, the largest district in New York City cannot have above approximately 177,000 people in it. And the smallest district in New York City cannot have below approximately 168,000 people in it. All right, so those are the bounds uh, to which we're looking at. Now, I wanna jump out of this training just for a moment uh, and take us to the, the census data, right? So, whoopsie. So this resource here is the census data broken up by uh, city council district. It's, uh, let me actually um, make it larger for folks. Uh, and just a note that any resource that I'll be talking about or looking at tonight with you all, I will also send out via email. So everybody will have all of the information that I cover uh, today plus more. Um, <clears throat> but just starting with council district uh, 33, and then I'll look at some of the other ones that folks mentioned. So Council District 33 in 2010 had 161,000 people in it. Now Council District 33 is uh, Northwest Brooklyn, it's uh, Williamsburg and Greenpoint and those neighborhoods. Anyone who's been to those neighborhoods knows that the amount of residential construction in them has been just at a mind blowing pace. And so their population has exploded, right? So they now have close to 210,000 people in it. Now, keep in mind, again, that the upper bounds of what a district can be over the next 10 years is going to be in that 177,000 range. So this district is going to have to contract by almost 30,000 people, right? How that happens is by nature political, right? Or, or not how, but uh, the, the results of that, right? So who they are represented by uh, for 30,000 people in this district uh, will change for the next 10 years. Um, the question for this district is, is really not if it will change, because we know for sure that it will be changing, it, it really is how. And ideally that question of how comes from as many people from the district as possible. So it should be people from District 33, from those neighborhoods of Williams, Greenpoint, et cetera, to be engaging in the process and saying, oh, you know, the best place to shed those 30,000 people are from here. And, you know, it makes sense to, to unite this, this community of interest in this district and so forth. Um, <clears throat> So let's look, I know a couple of you all mentioned District 40, so we can look at that as well. Um, uh, da, da, da. So 40 um, has 155,000 people. So it's actually the exact opposite problem, right? That uh, it's underpopulation. Um, the ideal population, again, being somewhere around 172,000 people, uh, it has almost 20,000 people to gain. To, to get up to that population, right? And so um, that means an expansion happens, which provides an opportunity for people in Council District 40, if there's a neighborhood that's cut in half, and we'll go through this, or a community of interest that's cut in half, or anything like this, um, certainly provides an opportunity to unite neighborhoods and grow uh, in, in ways that most benefit people around, around the district. So uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but what you'd see if you did go through all of them is that a, a very significant number of these these city council districts will be changing. Um, and so all, all the more reason uh, to, uh, to get involved in the process. Okay, so that's the first criteria um, and probably the most complicated uh, complicated one of all of them. Where are you? Um, so I'm gonna jump back to my, my presentation here. Yes, she, there you are. I'll mute. Uh, hey baby, her. I know. Whoops. <laughs> It totally happens. Um, okay, so that's that's this first criteria. Second criteria, um, 
is protecting minority votes. So this is a federal voting rights statute um, and it forbids district maps to dilute the voting power of racial or language minority groups. Uh, and the city charter has a very similar provision. Uh, the, the language there is fair and effective representation, uh, but same basic idea. So what this means in practical terms, just looking at, at a map, let's say this was a protected group, uh, this, these boxed in lines here, a map should not be doing this, right? Because that would dilute the power of that protected group. Um, so, so this is kind of an example visually of, of what this means. Now there's a few important uh, in, important pieces of it, you know, for this uh, particular go around. So, firstly, just to give some context, the the one of the main things the Federal Voting Rights Act did was set up uh, this idea of preclearance, which meant that any jurisdiction with a history of discrimination in its uh, at all was prohibited from changing anything having to do with voting. Uh, without receiving pre-approval from the Department of Justice. So what this meant practically is that every decade, New York City had to send in its maps, and not only its maps actually, but a full outlining of the process how, by which they came to those maps to show that the maps themselves were not discriminatory and the process ensured a fair uh, ability for all voices to be heard. Um, now, uh, in 2013, uh, the Supreme Court in one of the most disastrous decisions, in my opinion, of the last decade, I guess maybe until last week, uh, but they scrapped this, this federal requirement for preclearance. Uh, so that means that no longer does New York City need to send in its map uh, to get pre-approved before making any changes. And this likely will surprise nobody on this, on this call, but New York City does have a history of discrimination in its map making. And so because of that, as I said, every single decade, we'd have to send in our maps. Um, so this will be the first time that we don't have to do that. Uh, I put this picture on the right here of a submission. This was just the front page of the last, last decade submission. It's, uh, I think, two, 300 pages. And I said, it's really quite detailed, uh, kind of proving uh, the non-discriminatory nature of the process. So um, as Citizens Union, and again, I'll, I'll try and slip in kind of our advocacy side throughout, one of the many things we're advocating for is that even though the commission is no longer required to submit this uh, sort of document, essentially to do something like it anyway, to still submit or, or make public to all New Yorkers the rationale for why they chose the lines that they did uh, and, you know, proving the non-discriminatory nature of that. So hopefully that is one of the things we're advocating for that will be uh, accommodated. Okay, the next two are, are uh, substantially, I think, easier um, and honestly relevant to far fewer people uh, uh, throughout the city. So the first is uh, they have to be contiguous districts. So, you know, you can't have part of a district here and then a totally separate part of the district in another corner not, that isn't contiguous. Um, when a district is separated by a body of water, so we see here Council District 8 is, uh, it has to be connected in some way, whether that's a bridge, a ferry, a tram, or something. Um, and then the fourth of these kind of uh, required charter uh, or required map making uh, criteria is for crossover districts, right? So uh, again, using the exact same council district, council district eight, we see that it has a part of the district in the South Bronx and then a part of the district on in Northern Manhattan here. So it crosses county lines. So council districts, only one council district per set of two counties can do that. So for example, if council district nine uh, needed to, it would not be able to go into the Bronx because eight already does that. So it can only again happen once per set of two. Okay, so those were the first four criteria. Again, all four of those are required. These next four are charter mandates and the, the language in them is uh, something along the lines of, you know, to, to the most practical extent possible. Uh, so commissioners should follow these as much as they can. And the, the way they should follow them is in the order of priority that I put them on the screen. So keeping neighborhoods and communities of interest intact is the most important, followed by uh, keeping districts compact and gerrymandering and so forth. So again, just as we did, uh, we'll, we'll go through these one by one. So the first thing I wanna do is just read what uh, the definition of a community of interest verbatim. So 
Uh, a community of interest is a neighborhood, a community, or a group of people who have po common policy concerns and would benefit from being maintained in a single district. Another way of understanding a community of interest is that it is simply a way for a community to tell its own story about what neighbors share in common and what makes it unique compared to surrounding communities. It is defined by local community members. So I think what at least I take away from this definition is that unlike those last couple of parameters, which have very strict criteria about what is and what is not included, you know, numerically and all of this sort of thing, this one is wide open, right? This is saying, hey, you all tell us what your community is uh, and, and that's what'll count, right? So I'll go through a couple of examples, but I, I want the point here to be, you can throw all these examples out the window and really it is up for you as a community member to decide, hey, what is my community and why it should be kept together uh, in, in appealing to the commission. So ethnic, racial, and economic groups. Um, here, a, a very important sort of asterisk is that race alone cannot be a community of interest. So you can't say I'm of the same racial background as my neighbors, but as long as you're connecting it to policy uh, concerns, uh, and especially if you can connect it to other things, uh, then it, it absolutely can be a community of interest. Um, economic groups is a common one, right? So let's say you're of the same class background uh, as your neighbors. Often that comes with a set of policy concerns, right? Whether it's, I don't know, minimum wage laws or uh, you know, labor friendly practices or whatever. Um, and that needs representation on the council, right? And so you can absolutely say, hey, don't divide my community. We need to be kept together. So we have representation that reflects our economic concerns. Uh, places that share religious affiliations. Uh, areas within a single school district, right? So oftentimes we see in New York City that school districts are cut up uh, among many council districts. Um, certainly sometimes people want the entirety of their school district to be under the purview of a single council member, right? So arguing my school district is my community of interest, you know, uh, please keep that in mind. Areas with shared public transportation. I mean, gosh, New York City in many ways runs on uh, the lifeblood is our public transit. And so let's say you're a bus user, right? And, um, and you want, you say, oh, everyone on this bus line uh, within my neighborhood should be in my community of interest or is my community of interest so that we can elect someone who cares about buses and who cares about ma uh, mass transit uh, and represents those views to the council. Um, communities that share similar professions, right? So let's say you live amongst plenty of nurses and doctors and you're a nurse yourself or a doctor, you know, that also comes with a set of policy concerns, uh, safe staffing ratios or, or whatever it might be. And so again, same deal with these other ones saying, hey, we need someone who understands that, um, that perspective in that profession. Uh, so those are just some, but again, really to hammer that home, it is up to you. You define what your community of interest is um, and how you are connected to your neighbors in a geographic sense that then translates to a policy concern. Um, so here's a, a visual, uh, you know, not, not the most beautiful visual, but at least hopefully one that kind of can hammer home this point. So let's just say that this is our city, this full square. And let's say that these black lines are the district boundaries. And let's say this gray circle is your community of interest, whatever that interest may be. And let's say these other circles are other communities of interest, right? So theoretically, if this is how the city is split up, whoever is representing this red district may take your community of interest concern pretty minimally, right? You, you, you represent a minor vote share of their overall district. Uh, and so that may mean that your issue, whatever it may be, uh, would receive less advocacy, less attention, less press, uh, less legislation, less funding. Right, all of these things because that council member uh, may be much more tied up with these communities of interest that are more centrally located in their district. Right, so all of that, all of, you know, less funding, less advocacy, less legislation may mean that whatever that issue is gets worse over time. Right, so it very much can impact whatever the most important issue is for you and your neighborhood. Uh, the effects can be very tangible. Um, now, where redistricting comes in is let's just say that same city uh, is, is you know, drawn in this manner. Now, whoever is representing this red district, is it's going to be sort of impossible to ignore whatever your concern is uh, because you all represent a very significant percentage of their vote share, right? And so um, 
so again, this, this is sort of why it matters and how it can affect, why redistricting certainly come, uh, comes home to, to communities. Um, okay, so that's keeping communities of interest intact. Relatedly is keeping neighborhoods intact. And this is something that we find in all five boroughs. So again, I'm gonna jump out of the, the um, presentation here and use this New York City population fact finder tool. This is an amazing tool that I recommend playing around with uh, if you get a moment. So what I'm gonna do is click neighborhood tabulation area. So that's gonna split us up into neighborhoods. Um, and then I'll click add map layers and then click on New York City Council Districts, right? So uh, again, I believe some people said 40. Um, where is 40? Is this it? That's 35, 36. All right, so I'm gonna use 35 as an example because I'm, I'm staring at it. So here we see that uh, the blue lines are the council districts. And again, the neighborhoods are as we see here. So if I click a neighborhood, it's going to highlight the full neighborhood. And what we see is that just in this example, Crown Heights is split kind of down the middle. Crown Heights North, rather, is split kind of down the middle uh, between these two districts, right? Now, uh, often members of neighborhoods don't like this setup because they want a full, uh, you know, a council member to represent the full neighborhood and the interests of that full neighborhood. Um, it's not up to me to say if that works. Some neighborhoods are okay with that, but just kind of highlighting the issue uh, and showing that it exists really in almost every district. So um, let's uh, move around a little bit. Ah, here's, here's 40. Um, so we look at Flatbush, uh, or rather Flatbush and Dibbis Park. We certainly see the lines kind of cutting through in all sorts of ways. Um, Flatbush as well, and then East Flatbush, where my mom grew up. Uh, also cut cut between two districts. Um, I know someone said Harlem as well. Uh, so similar deal here uh, between Council District Seven and Nine in West Harlem. So again, I'm not going to go through every every neighborhood, but certainly the, the point is that in all districts throughout the city, uh, neighborhoods are cut into multiple different districts. Um, also with this tool, just as a a side note. If you click a neighborhood, you can click view data, and then it gives you the full data on who lives in that neighborhood, what their population is, you know, um, what their housing breakdowns are, et cetera. And that can be really helpful in kind of thinking about what the district is, what it should look like, what it could look like, et cetera. Um, okay, so uh, back to this training here. So that was keeping neighborhoods intact. Uh, next. Compactness, so no district should be drawn to be twice as long as it is wide. Um, so I'm using the uh, example of 32 here. Having such a elongated district certainly poses, can pose all sorts of challenges. Uh, for example, let's say, you know, a district this large or this, this non-compact uh, can make getting to your rep's office if you live on one side and they live on the other uh, rather challenging or even, you know, whoever lives down in uh, the Rockaways here may have a very different set of needs from a policy standpoint than whoever lives up here uh, in Ozone Park, right? So thinking about trying to keep neighborhoods as compact as possible. Um, and then the final one in terms of uh, um, criteria from the charter side uh, or from the, you know, uh, as much as possible to follow side is preventing partisan gerrymandering. So in the context of New York City, actually, uh, it's less about partisan gerrymandering. Obviously that's kind of front page news at the state and congressional levels, but within kind of how New York City politics works, it's less that lines are gonna be drawn to favor one political party over another political party. And much more commonly that lines are drawn to favor a, an incumbent or a candidate uh, over a different one. And so that's the sort of thing more so from the watchdog side that we're looking out for. Um, and just an example here, is some people may remember the Vidal Lopez story, uh, which is back in 2012, uh, an assembly member representing Bushwick named Vidal Lopez was in all sorts of scandals and calls were growing for him to resign. So a Lopez ally met with the commission uh, and ultimately convinced uh, for uh, lines that allowed Vidal Lopez to then 
uh, mount a city council run. Uh, obviously, this came out. It was a scandal, and they withdrew those maps. Um, but it's it's those sorts of stories from the gerrymandering side that, especially uh, as a watchdog ag agency, we're we're keeping our eye out. Um, huh? I did get it. Okay, and then you know to to end this sort of section, but to to hammer home what uh, Betsy was talking about in, in the beginning, you know. It, who your city council member is really does affect the quality of life and what is happening in your neighborhood. Um, I like to say, just look out your window and virtually everything you're seeing in some ways affected by your council member, uh, whether that's the trash on the street, uh, whether that's the potholes on your, on your road, whether that's your parks, whether that's your schools, uh, your hospitals, your police, your, you know, your fire, like all, all of it really is uh, incredibly affected by uh, the member that you are represented by. So that's a general statement. A little bit more specifically, uh, council members have pretty impressive powers in, in some areas. Um, so one such is land use, right? There's this tradition of member deference in rezoning applications, which is that typically, and it's, you know, a tradition, not a, not a rule or anything, but however, the local member of a neighborhood votes, the rest of the council votes with them. Uh, and that gives them pretty broad powers over the built environment of your neighborhood, right? Uh, discretionary funding, right? So each uh, each member gets millions of dollars to spend in their districts. Uh, they're the legislative body of New York City. They provide budget oversight um, uh, for the budget process. And you know that's arguably one of the more important things that city government does is deciding what to fund and what not to, uh, and then, or how much to fund it by. And then they provide constituent services at the most local level, right? So I, I would say it's in many ways, the kind of the first layer of government uh, between the people uh, and the state or the city. Um, okay, so that's the criteria. Uh, now I wanna go through how this process is gonna unfold. So who is drawing these maps? Uh, the body drawing these maps are the district commission, which is made of 15 people. Of those 15 people, the mayor appoints seven of them, or has it already appointed. Uh, the council appoints the other eight, but of those eight, three of them are appointed by the Republican or the minority conference, which is the Republicans. Five of them are appointed by the majority conference, which is the Democrats. All 15 have already been appointed. They've already elected their chair, which is a guy named Dennis Walcott, uh, who may be familiar for people. He was the, uh, he's the head of the Queens Public Library currently, uh, former education. Um, they've hired their executive director and they've already had their first two meetings. So the process is, has certainly uh, begun to, to roll up. Um, in terms of how the commission is picked, so the commission has to be representative of the city. One thing from the advocacy side that we are looking at is that representation uh, does not include gender. And so of the 15 commissioners, four are women and 11 are men. And so this is something that we were concerned about and we're advocating for before the picks uh, even happened um, and certainly are, are trying to consider how we can keep, uh, keep uh, that gender equity lens kind of front and center. Um, Commission can't be controlled by a party. Commission has to have at least one member from every borough. Uh, and this time around, I will say the commission is much better off in, in this regard compared to previous commissions. Previous commissions were very Manhattan centric, whereas this commission is pretty geographically diverse. There's I think three Brooklyn members, three Queens members uh, and so forth. So it's there's definitely representation from around the city. Um, and then lastly, commissioners can't be government or political party officials. So, you know, no uh, Bronx County, uh, Bronx Democratic County executive director uh, type of thing can be uh, appointed. One thing that we advocated for that they actually listened to is that we also said that no former elected officials uh, from the, anyone who's uh, been an elected official in the last five years should not be on the commission because of how close ties they, might, they may have with current incumbents. Uh, and not only did they listen to that, but they said they didn't uh, appoint any Buddy who'd been previously elected. So uh, that, that was really nice to hear that that sort of work and that recommendation uh, paid off. All right, so here is the timeline. Um, so the first major deadline is June 7th. And June 7th is when the draft maps uh, for New York City come out. Um, 30 days 
after those draft maps come out, they have to begin holding hearings. And they've told us that they will be holding hearings in all five boroughs, or they've not, uh, they have said they, they'll hold hearings in all five boroughs, um, uh, but we don't know the dates or locations or logistics quite yet. Um, and then a month after that, the, the maps get submitted to city council. But I actually wanna back up before we even get there. So I said June 7th is this first date. Historically, they've held preliminary hearings. Uh, so hearings prior to those draft maps to allow people to testify to help um, influence what those first maps look like. Uh, this time, it's looking like they may not do that. Uh, they So far, they've said they're not going to do that. They're not required to do that by the charter. And so this has been something that we just um, started uh, at, you know, we've been advocating for preliminary hearings all along, but once finding out that they won't be, we just uh, formed a, a sign-on letter that we got a couple of different groups to sign on to, and we either will be sending it, uh, we will likely be sending it tomorrow. Uh, there's a chance that we actually sent it today, but um, so that is an action that we're very much currently taking. Uh, anyway, back to this map. So regardless of if preliminary hearings are, are happen or not, the draft maps will be due. Those first round of hearings uh, is the, you know, the time to engage. And then the submission to, to city council in August. Now, city council has three weeks to accept or reject those maps. If they do neither, then the maps will be automatically accepted. And this whole process will be over sometime in early, uh, you know, late August, early September. If city council rejects it, then they will have time, the opportunity to provide feedback uh, and it triggers a second round. So then the commission would draw a second uh, set of uh, maps. They're actually not required to follow the feedback from city council, but they can. It would then uh, go to a second round of hearings in November. And then the final round of hearings would be December. Oh, sorry, the final uh, maps would be submitted to uh, city council in December. Now, one crucial thing to say about uh, this final submission is that if a majority, or not a majority, if nine out of 15 commissioners vote to accept the final, the final maps, the maps are adopted. City Council has no power to reject those maps, uh, to alter those maps, uh, to change those maps in any way. And so from a good government standpoint, we think that this process is inherently more independent than what we saw at the state level. Uh, you know, I, I really wanna, I'm sure many people are quite disillusioned with uh, how redistricting processes uh, roll out, but uh, we really want to assure folks that we don't foresee what happened on the state level to happen on the city level. As for a couple of reasons, but certainly very high among them is this forced independence that uh, the city council cannot overtake the process, cannot change the maps, cannot um, create uh, districts to to the, the way that they see fit. That the body really entirely in charge of it is the commission. Um, and then the final bullet point on this uh, timeline is. June, the following June. So the maps uh, would be implemented and then city council members, because there would be new districts, have to run uh, right away for, to represent their new districts. So typically a city council term is four years. This time around, it's two years to accommodate these new districts. Uh, and then there would be uh, another two-year cycle uh, and, then, um, and then back to the four years timeline in 2025. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip a few slides here because of time. Um, okay, so the, the next thing I wanna go over is building your own maps. So again, you know, people can feel rather intimidated when I recommend this. Uh, so I really wanna try and make this user-friendly. Um, because this is a geographic exercise, if you say to the commission, please keep my district intact, okay, or rather keep my neighborhood intact, that's great, um, but showing them a map of exactly what you want is a far more powerful testimony. And it, it really, uh, I think this process will really uh, get ingratiated in you and ingrained in you once you start looking at, at maps. So uh, there's a bunch of user-friendly software that makes this um, frankly quite easier than it, it would be otherwise. The one that we're recommending, although there's plenty, is uh, representable.org. So what representable.org allows you to do is census track by census track, click what you think your district should be. 
And then as you click these census tracts, it has a population counter here that goes along with it. So you can be assured that you're within the ideal population or you get to that uh, you know, approximate population size. Um, so just to zoom out and show you how it looks. So I just clicked around a bunch of different census tracts to get to that ideal population size. Uh, so again, I think this is right around exactly where it needs to be. Um, and this took me all of five minutes. Now that said, this could not be a district. And, and the reason this could not be a district is districts are, or the district map is a jigsaw puzzle. And this would in no way fit in with uh, the current set of maps. And so one, I wanna just make sure no, no one thinks I'm proposing this as a district because I'm not, but just to, to elucidate you know, what this looks like when you, when you finally create a district. At the end, you can download this as a PDF and then send it right along to the commission uh, for submission. So ideally this, this can be something uh, that you can use. And if you have questions about it, along with any of this stuff, really I'm happy to help you out uh, with it. Um, the other thing to say is this population fact finder tool, which I showed you earlier, uh, can also help you begin thinking about your district. So it has a very similar idea where census fact track by census track, uh, you can click around and see how big the population is, what the demographics are, what the housing breakdown is, and so forth. Okay, so this last uh, last part of uh, what I'll talk about, and then I'll uh, open it up for questions. So um, elements of an effective testimony. So uh, just, just out of curiosity, have, have people testified before? I guess give me a, whoops, some yes, some no. Um, so if you have a way that you like testifying, great. Uh, and, you know, we're certainly not, not here to say one is, is better than other. What we did want to do is provide with as, you know, kind of break it down to make it uh, as manageable as possible for people hoping to testify but not sure the best place to start. And so what we're saying is that if you answer the four questions on the screen, you have an effective testimony. Uh, so those four questions are, who are you? What's the issue? Why is it an issue? How should it be resolved? If you do that, if you go through each one of those things, um, we believe you've given the commission what they need to know uh, to understand your perspective. So to go through each one, um, the who. So here you wanna say your name. You wanna say where you live. And I think this can be uncomfortable for people uh, we're not saying sort of exact address necessarily, but because this is a geographic exercise, grounding yourself in place and saying, oh, I've been a member of this community for 20 years, five years, one year, 30 years, um, helps credentialize you, right? Helps to show, okay, well, this person lives here, knows the neighborhood, knows the district, um, and you know, adds weight to the testimony. Uh, personal background, and I say keep it brief, really only put things that are relevant. Um, or only put a couple of words. Uh, in, in verbal testimony, you'll likely only get three minutes, which is not a lot of time. Uh, and so this, you know, just straight to the point, but a, and similar to organizational affiliation, um, but both of those things, again, help further credentialize you as a community member, as someone to take seriously. Um, organizational affiliation, I mean, you can certainly, you're all, or many of you are citizens union members, uh, so that's certainly a place to start, but any, uh, any affiliation you may have. So what this looks like, um, this is a, a testimony from 10 years ago that I thought the, where the who section was uh, succinct and strong. So this person says, good evening, my name is blank. I've been a Queens resident for more than 10 years and live at blank Rigo Park, right? So right away, all right, we know this person is someone to take seriously. They've lived in the neighborhood for 10 years and they live in Rigo Park. So that's what we're thinking about. That's where, that's where we're looking at. I'm a counselor at Baruch College, right? So she does the personal background in six words. Um, and then I'm testifying as a 10 year member of OCA. And so that's the organizational affiliation. So she does her whole who section, that's probably 25 seconds, right? And it gets all of those basic, uh, basic information in and certainly kind of sets herself up uh, to, to be a, a serious person to, you know, from the community uh, uh, to testify. Okay, what? So why are you here? Um, what's the issue, right? What, what is the main thing that you're hoping the commission is gonna take from your testimony? Um, so here, this may look like, you know, I live in council district, whatever. 
uh, and the current map splits my community into multiple council districts. And so I'm here because I want to ensure that that community of interest uh, is all in one district, right? Um, another example, the old map uh, kept my community of interest all, all in, in one. Uh, so I'm here because I want to ensure that you keep my community of interest in that same uh, district. Uh, or the new maps uh, have removed the hospital from my district. And I'm here because I think the hospital needs to remain in my district, right? So all of these and millions more, but the point is, right, getting to the point straight, why are you here and what is the concern that's bringing you out? That same woman from OCA, her what, what section uh, summarized in just these two sentences, proposed district 25 divides Elmhurst primarily at the district's Southwest boundary this boundary excludes an active part of Elmhurst that stretches to the LIE, right? So she's here because uh, the, you know, uh, uh, an important part of Elmhurst has been excluded from her district. Why, right? So after saying what, okay, so yeah, your district cuts off part of Elmhurst, but why is that important, right? Why does that matter? Uh, how does it affect you? How does it affect your community? And then is there evidence to show that it affects you or your community? Um, and so here, when we think of evidence, uh, there's anecdotal evidence, uh, which is great if you have it, uh, but as much as possible, we really wanna lean on data uh, if you have the time and capacity to obtain that. So uh, demographic data, census data, um, budgets, maps, all of these things, again, really add strength and weight to your testimony if you have the ability uh, to, to obtain some of that information. Um, so what that might look like, my community of interest is split. Right, and then provide a map. Look, we're, you can see right for yourself that this, uh, that this boundary splits us into two. Uh, this has meant that there's been a lack of funding when compared to other communities of interest in the district. And here, provide numbers, right? So look, our, our community of interest has only gotten X number of dollars for the issue we care about. Uh, and that lack of funding has meant these issues and provide information, right? So uh, again, if possible, instead of just anecdotes, uh, you wanna beef up the testimony uh, with, with that info. And then finally, how should the issue be resolved, right? So what specifically do you want the commission to do or consider or change, right? And, and so here you, you wanna be specific, you wanna speak in geographical terms and you wanna ask for what you want, not what you don't want. So what I mean by that is, Instead of saying, keep my community of interest together, uh, you wanna say, please move the Southwest boundary of the district to whatever avenue to ensure that my community is, is kept whole, right? But because we wanna speak in geographic terms so the commissioners know exactly what you are proposing the district should look like. And you should not say what you don't want, you should say what you do want. So instead of you know saying, don't split my community or don't split my neighborhood, say again, please move the, you know, the district boundary to whatever avenue to ensure that we're whole, if that's what you are uh, advocating for. Um, okay, so some best practices when testifying. Um, in verbal testimony, be concise and be to the point, right? So I mentioned beforehand, you only get three minutes. So you do wanna practice ahead of time. You wanna time yourself. If you're over time, you wanna make sure to make the cuts that you need so that you are within that three minute time frame, uh, you know, to, to ensure your, your full testimony is heard. You can provide a written testimony and the written testimony can be as long as you want, right? So it could be word for word what you said in the verbal testimony, or uh, you could elaborate if you didn't have time to say everything you wanted to say. Um, speak clearly and make eye contact, right? So all of these good basic public speaking practices, uh, trying to remain relaxed, taking deep breaths, it can certainly be intimidating. Uh, and so just trying to ground yourself if that is something that uh, is hard for you. Um, and, you know, again, take deep breaths uh, and, and uh, don't, don't speak too quickly. Uh, I mentioned providing a written copy of the testimony. Providing a map, again, we talked about. Um, thanking the commission, it's thankless work in, in many ways. Uh, and then these last two, there's, uh, the first one is there's strength in numbers, right? So um, organize, so you know the idea there is if, if you alone go and say, hey, please move the Southwest boundary of the border to whatever block, 
that's great. But if you're a bunch of your neighbors go or many people in your community go and say the same thing, uh, the likelihood that that's going to stick out in the minds of the commission uh, is, is certainly higher. And so uh, we really want to encourage folks to not only testify themselves, but uh, try and link up with other networks uh, to create greater force with their testimony. And then in some ways, the opposite of that, uh, something is better than nothing. And so I, I wanted to put this in here to essentially say, you know, um, it certainly can feel intimidating. You may not have capacity to make your own map uh, or to find data that you need or things like that. I certainly hope you do and you'll consider doing it. Um, but if you don't, something is better than nothing. So if you have something to say about what your district should look like, um, getting that out there into the commission is better than not doing it all. And so we really do encourage you uh, to at least get something out there. Um, the last thing I wanna look at is, you know, again, because of this, um, what's happening at the state level, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it has the effect of making people less inclined or, or at least disillusioned uh, to, to testify. And, you know, especially for people that spent a lot of time creating maps and creating testimony for the state process, uh, only to have much of it uh, thrown out. And so, um, again, I, I really want to hammer home that, that the the city process is in many ways quite different. And I, here I want to show the staff memoranda from 2012. And so what this document is, is it, it goes through every single district and why they chose the lines that they did 10 years ago. And uh, the, the district I'll, I'll start with showing is a, a neighborhood that I was just in for a training last week in the Bronx. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll just show it to you. Uh, since uh, I'm here. So I'm switching over to the population fact finder. And so the neighborhood is this neighborhood here, Van Nest. And in this part, in District 13 on the right, uh, is a large Yemeni population. And then right at where the boundary is, is uh, where in District 15 is where a lot of the mosques are, uh, a lot of the, uh, the commercial strip called Little Yemen uh, is as well. And so this major Yemeni cultural center and the Yemeni population itself are split off. And so this is something that is uh, very concerning to the, the community up there. I'm going up there again, actually, in I think two weeks to talk to talk with them. But so um, this district, uh, let's look at what they said 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, uh, let me just make this a little bigger for you. So he, here's what it says. District 13 is comprised of the neighborhoods of... I'm not gonna try and pronounce that. Scheulerville, Pelham Gardens, Bronxwood, Bronxdale, uh, et cetera. The, the district boundaries remain largely the same. Minor changes were made to the Western boundary to decrease the population deviation and allow the Parkside Nitro development to be unified in District 15 as requested in public testimony. In response to public testimony, this is why I'm showing it to you, the revised plan keeps the Van Ness neighborhood in districts 13 and 15 instead of dividing the area into three council districts as proposed in the previous preliminary plan. Additionally, the revised plan creates a new boundary in the area where districts 12, 13, and 15 meet. So the point of why I'm showing that to you is to, to show that oftentimes public testimony really does have sway, right? So in this instance, they put out their draft maps uh, that neighborhood was cut into three council districts. People from the district came out uh, and ultimately they split into two. And I think this time around, they're hoping to get it unified all in one. Um, we'll see if that happens. But the point is that if you were to go through almost every single one of these districts, uh, really a sizable amount of them say this exact same thing, that in response to public testimony, we did this, right? So that, uh, you know, the community came out and we'd listen to them. So I'm hoping to show that in many ways uh, to, to try and re-illusion those who have been disillusioned by what's happened at the state. Um, the final slide, I know we're running a little over, so I'm, uh, I'll end it here and, and uh, try and answer any questions. But um, the first thing is, if you want more information, we are having a, a, a mini site called uh, citizensunion.org slash NYC redistricting. And everything I've gone over on this presentation, plus plenty more information is gonna be available on that site or is available on that site. So we're try trying to treat that as like a one-stop shop for all things council redistricting uh, throughout this process that folks can check uh, if, they, if they have questions. Um, if you do have questions, 
You can email me. This is my email address, dkaminsky at citizensunions.org, uh, citizensunion.org. Um, it really is a priority to help for me to help you engage in this process however you would like to. So please don't be shy. I'm really happy to help. Um, and along those lines, if you're part of a different group, whether it's a you know different organization, different coalition, whatever, and you want me to come in um, and do a training and kind of go through everything with that group, I'm, I'd be more than happy to do that. I'm trying to get to, as said before, as many corners and many nooks and crannies of this city as I can. So really please email me and connect me with whoever. Uh, and I'm so happy to come in and, and um, continue trying to get folks engaged in, in the redistricting process. Um, so with that, uh, I'll stop sharing um, and I will uh, answer any questions that you all have. Uh, Mike, I see that you have your hand raised. Okay, that's better. Hi. Um, so I represent the disability community. And although we're the largest and poorest minority, uh, we are totally intersectional. Um, and we live where we can afford to. So mm -hmm. there's no contiguous areas. But is there any other way? I mean, can you say organizationally, if there was a cluster of disability advocacy organizations in a particular neighborhood, could we be sure that, and I'm thinking of my own district right now, right? There are uh, a great, uh, this is district two. So starting with um, Sydney down by 14th street, then up along 23rd street, there are a number of organizations, but the question is, can services, available in a district be a reason for create, you know, expanding or redesigning a district? Um, so what, how I'm hearing that question is really a community of interest question, uh, yeah. which is to say that, you know, if, so I think there's a strong, you can absolutely make the case that your community of interest is in these locations and you need better services for X, Y, Z reasons, and therefore you all should be contained in a district. Um, does that? Yeah, if you think that we could accomplish that, that would be, I mean, see, like if we're reliant on census data, we're screwed because mm -hmm. the census exactly. data says we're 11% and the CDC more rightfully puts it at 26% of adults have some form of disability, right? Mm. But census data don't help us because they, ask the question wrong with our community. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, collect the right kind of data. Um, and so there's that great divergence. Well, would the commission uh, accept CDC data to back up why we are a larger, we are the largest minority and yeah. we're a very, very large community of interest and we have yeah, to be yeah. listened to, but we never are. Totally. So I'm wondering how we accomplish that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. So um, the the data that is being used, uh, unfortunately, or, you know, is is the census data. Uh, so that's the that's the data from my understanding that that they'll be basing the numbers off of for for their districts. Um, but in terms of if I, if I can add one thing, yeah, um, I, I do think uh, um, that for communities, communities of interest can can feel free to use other data sources uh, to kind of argue, um, make the claim about their uh, communities and where where it's at. Like Dan mentioned before, you know, if you're all uh, part of the same class or have the same employment uh, or are employed in similar professions, these don't necessarily come from the U.S. Census. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, it's true that the main source of information is the US Census, but um, I think it's possible to bring any other data source. These are, uh, at the end of the day, the commissioners are human beings and they, um, you know, and they know uh, to make the evaluation whether a data source is uh, relevant or not. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Um, I see Carol asked, will it be possible to give in-person testimony during the pandemic or will everything be by video? Uh, I don't believe we know that yet. I said that the, um, the commission is really just getting started. They've only had two meetings. So I, I, I don't think they've announced the details about, uh, you know, how this is all going to go down, but certainly once they do, uh, we'll, we'll provide those, we can provide those details on our website. Thanks for asking. Um, Dan? Yes, yeah, go for it. Dan, can you talk a little bit about the state fiasco and um, how that has been resolved? I think it's somewhat confusing to everybody. Uh, just don't go into too much detail, but sort of just talk a little bit about how it happened. Sure. Okay. So uh, without going into too much detail, um, the, so 2014, a constitutional amendment was passed. How the process was supposed to go was four, Demo so uh, four people appointed uh, to, a, no, there was an independent redistricting commission made of 10 people. Of those 10, four were supposed to be Democrats, four were supposed to be Republicans, two were supposed to be appointed by those other eight. Uh, then those 10 people were supposed to go around the state, listen to the, you know, listen to people and create uh, a first set of maps, submit it to the legislature. If the legislature rejected it, create a second uh, round of maps, submit those to the legislature. If that second round of maps was rejected, then the legislature could draw its own maps, but those maps could not deviate more than 2% from the maps that were submitted by the Independent Redistricting Commission. What actually happened was it ended up being five Democrats and five Republicans on this Independent Redistricting Commission. They ended up not being able to agree on one set of maps to submit to the legislature. So they submitted two separate sets of maps, one Democratic map, one Republican map. The legislature then uh, threw out those maps. And instead of doing a second round, they took over the process then, drew their own maps, uh, and those were the maps that uh, ended up, you know, being the maps. Those, they were then, uh, those maps were ultimately uh, sued. The Senate and congressional maps uh, were brought to court, not the assembly map in the first round. Um, it went all the way to the highest uh, court in the land, the Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals threw out the Senate and congressional maps appointed a special master to draw a singular person to draw the new maps for Senate and Congress. Um, that Those sets of maps were just released on uh, yesterday and people have till tomorrow to testify on those maps. Um, and actually, you know what, let me, uh, let me drop in two links to the chat. Um, the first link, if you wanna look at the maps is uh, a website based uh, that CUNY runs, Redistricting in You. It's a very nice software, very user-friendly in my opinion. Um, and you can look at the maps compared to the old, uh, you know, the prior maps and then the newer maps uh, released by the special master. Um, and then the second is if you do want to submit testimony, you have until tomorrow. Uh, and so the way to do that would be to email this email address, bweiss at newyorkcourts.gov. Um, so that's until tomorrow. And then on Friday, uh, the final maps will be adopted by the special master, again, for Senate and Congress. Uh, because of this whole situation, the primaries for those two have been moved to August 23rd. June 28th was the original primary. The statewide races, governor, lieutenant governor, uh, comptroller, attorney general, are still on June 28th as well as the assembly. So the assembly was not in the original lawsuit. Follow-up lawsuits were brought uh, against to throw out the assembly maps. That didn't end up happening. Um, so the assembly maps are still in play. A follow-up lawsuit just actually uh, in the Manhattan Supreme Court, I believe, uh, was just filed today or yesterday. Uh, I believe yesterday. Uh, but, you know, presumably, we'll, we'll see, but presumably the assembly maps are will remain for August, uh, sorry, June 28th. Uh, and then from the advocacy side, we have advocated for combining those two dates to so moving the June 28th primary to August 23rd to make it easy for voters 
uh, because voter turnout, among other reasons, cost, you know, et cetera, is going to be abysmal by having them separated. Um, but as of now, the governor uh, mm -hmm. has not liked that idea. And so we'll be keeping the June 20th primary on in June 28th. And then we have the Senate congressional primary on August 23rd. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Yeah, is it just the governor who gets to decide that or is there any way the public can weigh in? Because, you know, the expense involved, but more than that, August, you know, if you don't have a marquee uh, race, like the governor's race, who's going to come out in August? Nobody. It's so unfair to all the, the candidates. How, how can we, is there anything we can do or is that it? The governor just says, no, I don't want to give anybody else a chance to spell out their arguments, so I want this early. Um, how, how can they be combined? Uh, ben, I'm going to kick that question to you. <laughs> it's a, that's a, a great question, Mike. Uh, I would say, you know, formally or officially, it's not that the governor is the only uh, decision maker. Um, the legislature can pass a law that moves the primaries to August, the governor can veto it if she wants, and the legislature can override the veto, just like any other law. Um, I think politically, it seems like the legislature doesn't want to get into a fight with the governor, and um, and especially not before an, uh, an election. Um, but uh, the way to influence that is to... Um, is to call your uh, your local senate, state senator or, or assembly member and let them know that you think that's a horrible idea and it should be changed. Because uh, you know there are a lot of voices in the legislature that say that uh, the two primaries should be consolidated, including the chairs of the elections committee that will have to approve that law, and the the the, the uh, majority leader of the New York State Senate even said that she thinks that's a good idea. Um, so the more people kind of put pressure on the executive and the governor's side, uh, the greater chances that um, that will happen. Thank you. All right, y'all. Um, so I look out for an email tomorrow. I'll email everybody uh, just a ton of resources um, about everything I went over here, you know, uh, some of our advocacy efforts, et cetera. Um, and please be in touch. And as I said, I'm, I'm really happy to, to come in and help anyone engage in this process however I can. Good. Thank you, Dan. It's really good. Thank you, Dan. And I'm glad. Take Bye, care. Everyone. Thank you, Kana. Good, good, good. Bye, everyone.